As you just heard from Tsveti, I'm Mika Mures. I'm a professor of economics. And now that you know that, you're thinking, oh no, economics, the dismal science, and the last talk of the day, and maybe you're trying to think how you might get out the back door. <laughs> but I hope you won't do that. Uh, and if you stay, I'm going to try to explain to you how we might make economics less dismal. So uh, first of all, how many of you have taken an economics class? OK, a whole bunch of you. So maybe some of you have already been wondering about some of the things I'm going to talk about today. But maybe others of you who haven't taken an economics course or weren't thinking these things are wondering, why should I care about this, the work of some dusty old economist in some kind of an ivory tower? But I want to tell you that the models that economists work on are used to determine things that are really important to your life like interest rates that get set to try to fend off recessions or inflation, or the advice that your financial broker is going to give you about how much you should save for your old age. So the thing is, though, that in many fields, the experts use different kinds of approaches. And those different approaches compete with each other and drive rapid change in how the experts do their work. But economics is different. Since around the 1950s, economics has been pretty much completely dominated by one approach. And that approach is grounded in some assumptions that people behave like this character, Homo economicus. And what I want to tell you is that the models that we build that are based on this assumption utterly fail to predict economic outcomes. So here, what I'm showing you uh, are two graphs. These graphs were made in 2008 by economists predicting economic performance over the very near future. The little gray lines show the predictions by individual economists or institutions. The green line, if you can see it there, is the average prediction. And the big black line that makes the big dip is actual economic performance. Because as you might remember, this is data for the US economy, the US economy took a big plunge uh, in around 2009 or the end of 2008. Now, what you can see there is that the, on the third quarter, on the left, the third quarter of 2008, economists were predicting a downturn, but kind of a little small downturn, and then a quick recovery. On the right, you see the graph from the fourth quarter of 2008. Now, the economy is pretty much already in free fall, but economists were still dramatically under-predicting the extent of the fall and over-predicting how quickly the economy would recover. But it's not just that economists fail to, produce, uh, to predict big things like recessions. Economists also do really poorly in predicting much smaller things like whether a food production program in Africa might reduce child nutrition. So money gets spent on these policies, but they don't have the intended impact. So what I want to explain today is how we can trace these failures to that assumption that people behave like homo economicus. And I want to tell you that we need to replace this assumption by a different assumption. The assumption that people behave like personae sociales, social people. Now, to understand my argument, let's start by taking a little closer look at that character, Homo economicus. Homo economicus is first and foremost economicus, always carefully calculating each decision to make sure that it will bring the most possible happiness given that actor's resources. But Homo economicus is also homo, which means in Greek, same or in Latin, man. So economists would find it very difficult to build an economic model based on all the unique behaviors of individuals, of a large number of individuals. So economists instead make their models based on the behavior of a single individual called the representative agent. This representative agent behaves the same as most other individuals usually like a man modeled on male behavior. But sometimes people say that this agent is modeled on gender-neutral behavior of an average person with no gender. So these assumptions might seem kind of OK to you. I mean, don't most people try to make themselves as happy as possible? And why shouldn't we study the behavior of an average person? 
But I want to explain to you why both of these assumptions is, is actually highly problematic. So let's turn first to the economic assumption. In order to behave like homo economicus would behave, you have to be always carefully comparing each decision you make with every other possible decision. So suppose you're in the airport and you want a coffee. You have to think, before you spend $3 on that coffee, about every other possible use for that $3. And that would, of course, take an enormous amount of brain power, as well as time collecting information and so on. And not only do you have to compare that coffee with every other option that's available to you that same day, you have to compare it with every possible option you would have in the future. But that requires information that you can't possibly know, like what will next year's iPhone look like, or will there be a recession next year? So most of us, all of us in fact, can't possibly make those kinds of calculations, especially because we can't even know relevant information. So instead, we rely on what economists call a rule of thumb. That is a simple behavioral rule, like buy a new phone every two years, or save 10% of my income. Now you might wonder, where do we get that rule? So there are different possibilities. One is, we make our rule based on our past behavior. Something I did before worked okay, I'll do that again. Or maybe we base it on a social norm that we value, like be thrifty. Or maybe we look around ourselves to what other people are doing, and we model our behavior on the behavior of someone else who seems to be pretty successful. So to give you an example of how this might work, I want to tell you about some work I was doing with uh, Bulgarian tobacco farmers back in 1995. So in 1995, the tobacco monopoly was in the process of being privatized. And the monopoly had announced that it was broke, bankrupt. And as a result, it didn't pay any of the tobacco producers for the products that they delivered. So this was a big shock to the tobacco farmers, and I went out to see how they were adjusting to this shock. So I was driving around the countryside in my blue Lada and stopping where I saw people in the field and hopping out and talking to them. And so I would ask, how's it going? And everybody would say, terrible. We didn't get paid. There's no money for seeds. What can we live on? And so on. So then I would ask, so with your land, could you do something else? And absolutely everybody I spoke to said yes. Some people said, well, I have really good land. I could do anything with this land. And other people said, well, my land's not so good, but I could produce potatoes. So then I would ask, so will you do that in view of the current situation? And almost every single person said no. Oh, I was a little surprised. Why? And they told me very interesting things. People told me, well, we're tobacco farmers here. That's a rule of thumb. Or else they said, we have these customs or these habits. Also a rule of thumb. One man told me, tobacco is the most profitable crop. That's also a rule of thumb, although one that in this case was kind of contradicted by the empirical evidence. So mostly when I was out driving around, I found men in the field and I spoke with men. But I spoke with one woman, and her behavior, her responses, were quite different, which is something that will be important in a minute. So she said to me, when I asked if she would do something else, yes, next year I will plant potatoes, because if I don't get a good price for my potatoes, I can feed them to my cow. So you might think, well, OK, but it just takes people a while to adjust their behavior. But now I'm going to tell you about another example, which I think is very interesting. This is based on research uh, by two economists uh, from Harvard and New York universities. And they used 2005 data from the Afrobarometer survey, which surveys populations in Africa. And they were looking at trust. Now, trust is very important for economic activity because since contracts are never complete, you need to trust people in, in order to be able to engage in exchange. So what these researchers looked at was whether the trust behavior of populations that lived in areas that had been affected by the slave trade back in the 1800s was different from the trust behavior of people, populations that lived in areas that had not been affected by the 
slave trade so long ago. And what they found was very distinct differences. People who lived in areas that had been affected by the slave trade were much less likely to trust 150 or more years later than people who lived in areas that had not been affected by the slave trade. So, of course, this doesn't mean that people never change their behavior. But it does mean that if you base your economic models on the assumption that people change their behavior quickly and homogeneously, then your models are going to really mispredict economic outcomes. So what I want to tell you here is that we need to change that assumption of homo economicus to an assumption of homo socialis. That is, an agent that has limited cognitive ability and therefore uses a rule of thumb, which is heavily influenced by the people around him. So now let's think about the other part of the assumption, the homo part. So what's the problem with using a representative agent in our model? The problem is that as economists have been looking more closely at the behavior of different economic agents, in particular male and female agents, we've discovered that there are very significant differences in the way that men and women respond to economic changes. So one example is with spending behavior. So there's a study from 1998 by Shelley Phipps and Peter Burton that found that Canadian women are much more likely than Canadian men to spend an increase in their income on care for their children. But maybe more surprising is the difference we're finding in financial market behavior. So uh, many studies, Sorry, I forgot to show you the unrepresentative agent. Many studies, like this one, have found that men and women respond very differently to investment risk. So this study by Bankrate in 2013 shows you that men were much more likely than women to say that they would accept more financial risk if it meant that there was the possibility of a larger payoff. So, what this means is that if we want to include in our model that ungendered agent, and we don't account in our model for the likely gender breakdown of our agents, we're going to mispredict very important outcomes like spending, savings, and investment. So, we need to replace the homo part of that assumption with a personae assumption. That is, the inclusion of representative agents of both genders. And then we need to take that gender disaggregated behavior and incorporate it into our standard macroeconomic models. So some very preliminary work in this area is being done now with funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and coordinated at American University. So what we need to do then is to replace that assumption of homo economicus, with an assumption of personae, persons, sociales, social. And then we need to adjust the way that we teach economics accordingly. So this doesn't mean that we have to throw out every standard model based on homo economicus. But it does mean that we need to give much more attention to other approaches, approaches that focus on cognitive limitations and also on gender differences. And we need to, uh, to sorry, incorporate also current research, most recent research on behavioral economics, evolutionary economics, and feminist economics. I have a former graduate student who liked to tell me that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem you see looks like a nail. And what we need to do is we need to give our students a much broader set of tools so that they can approach a much broader set of problems appropriately. And if we do that, we might even be able to make economics less dismal. Thank you.